And we are live for another episode of COVID Cast JA. This is episode 34. Today is November 26, and just happy Thanksgiving to our North American neighbors. We in Jamaica, we like to say we give thanks every day. So happy Thanksgiving and welcome to episode 34 of COVID Cast JA. Today we're going to be talking about a very, very important matter that has really become something of greater concern now that we have got virtual. So we had face-to-face -face meetings with nice finger food where we could turn up, pop in, go out, and now everything is up in the air because we are virtual. How do we run effective meetings in this virtual world? One, but very importantly, whether we are face-to-face -face in person or we are online. How do we run more effective meetings? And we have a fantastic panel this evening. We're going to be joined by our lead project architect for the PSOJ Access to Finance project, um, a face that you're very familiar with, Mr. Nevada Poe. And then we're also going to be joined by two ladies, Lorianne Ainsworth, who is CEO of the Branson Center for Entrepreneurship in the, in the Caribbean, and our first guest, a lady I know very well, who is probably the most expert at running effective meetings. Her name is Althea Walters. She is manager group administration for JMMB Group Limited and founder and lead trainer at Blazing Beyond. Althea manages the operations of the group CEO's office at JMMB Group and provides leadership and oversight in the areas of general and strategic administration. She is the founder and lead trainer of Blazing Beyond. And if you do not currently follow them on Instagram, take a moment and follow her. She holds a master's degree in human resource development from the University of the West Indies, Mona. She's also creator of My Goal Tracker, a goal planning workbook and coaching service that guides persons to take bold and consistent actions in achieving their personal life goals. In support of her volunteer efforts, she also serves as international and programs commissioner for the Girl Guides Association of Jamaica, where she leads in the development of programs and international activities for the young girls and women within the association. She exudes excellence, and I'd like to add to that, a calm and measured poise. And she is a firm believer that it is not an act, but a habit which leads her to be well known by all and sundry all of the world as someone who is the go-to, the can-do leader, who is multifaceted and dynamic, and we get her here on COVID Cast JA. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome, Althea Walters. <laughs> Hello, Rochelle. Rochelle, what an introduction, Rochelle. <laughs> now we have to look all of that, right? <laughs> so, Althea, so that people um understand because you know when i'm describing that althea is known internationally so yes, just give a little I'm claiming that okay i'm, I'm known internationally I beg your claim it. <laughs> <laughs> a group administrator manager of jmmb group can you just give us a snippet of what a regular day in the life of althea looks like where meetings are concerned well so let me tell you there is no same regular day, right? But we have very we we have meetings, you know, where we have a lot of you know activities and strategic activities going on. And so we we have different portfolios managing. And the the activities are are so they're intense, you know. We we actually serve intensely collectively in the GMB group. And I know you can attest to that at some points. So the, it's very fast paced. And so you're, you're moving from discussions to decisions to, you know, collaborations, you know, you're, it's so intense. So you're, you have to know, put all the pieces together. So in a regular life and in a regular day within my portfolio, you know, it's, it's, it's so intense that sometimes you, you're not pausing to think. So that means that you would have to plan way ahead, way ahead. in order to have this managed effectively. And I, I like where you have started the planning ahead. 
Yeah. And when we think about planning ahead and you know i always say that you know sometimes people like to feel important there's a certain level of importance is i have a meeting oh, or yes. a meeting about that let's gather together to discuss that right now, in a 24-hour period we know when we set several meetings and worse in this zoom world that the meetings can just be running back to back mm -hmm. basic questions how do you ensure that the right people attend a meeting so, so, Rochelle, you touch on a good point because guess what? Meetings are so resource intensive that we can't afford to have, you know, everybody in the meeting, especially persons who may not be the key persons. But, um, however, in terms of making sure you're looking at what decisions are we looking to make, you know, which, which portfolios are impacted, you know, which leaders. And you're also looking at dependencies across the board. If it is a situation where, of course, you want to make sure that there are additional support persons for those key functional areas, you bring them along. So you're looking, you know, who needs to, who needs to be a part of this decision, right? So we can't make a decision without these persons in the room. The decision we can't, right the decision makers we can't move forward with some critical dependencies you know um that is going to drive the thing especially if you don't have a long period of time that you have to plan because sometimes mm -hmm. we do have urgent matters that come up so maybe you're making the decision but at the same time you're bringing on the collaborators and the, de the dependencies at the same time because you want it to be one collective um discussion so that we can move quickly because you know that in this time and the world agility and flexibility is the key so that is what is going to determine who really the meeting okay so Althea, um I, I know sometimes people are not invited to a meeting and they may feel a bit offended like how come this this group is gathered this august body is gathered and i have not been invited do you have situations where you've organized a meeting around particular dependencies and you have people right. why am i not a part of it this and insisting that they're a part of it and how do you handle that kind of situation it's sometimes it's a tricky situation. We're coming from, as you said, an era where, you know, meetings are, is, a, is, a, is a sense of importance, you know? And so persons want to be acknowledged as important. However, there are times when there are a group of persons who may just need to be informed about what happened in the meeting and they may not be a critical input at the time. So you have to categorize your group of persons like that as well, so that if it they have to they, they should be informed you can update them via an email a quick discussion after but they may not be critical to the collaboration and the decision that is there however as i did say there's there are times when the matter is moving so fast that mm -hmm. you may just bring in those persons but um it's a sensitive matter but if up front um, persons understand role and accountability is going into meetings and where they would be required and which functional um, units or heads will be required. I think it reduces the whole conversation about why am I not in the meeting. So okay. as, a, as, a, as an organization, as a business, the culture, the meeting culture also has to be very explicit and known mm -hmm. to persons. The persons know, okay, you are needed for these types of meetings, etc. but we'll pull you in if needed. Okay. So Althea, in terms of matters such as confirmation and cancellation of the meetings, how do you manage confirmation of those who will in fact be attending and how do you handle where the meeting has to be suddenly canceled? Okay, so the confirmation, that's the, that's the, Easier. Sometimes the cancellation could be easy now, but the confirmation, if you have enough lead time and you set a meeting, they say, for example, you have a week out. Sometimes there are standard meetings, standard weekly meetings, standard monthly meetings. It is always good to know at least two days before who are the persons who are coming to the meeting. So mm -hmm. you, you set your time and agenda around that so that you beforehand, you already know. Even if you did a, didn't get a chance to you know, manage your confirmations, confirmations can come via various methods, mm -hmm. you know, email, um, WhatsApp these days because we're so fast paced, you know, it's a quick WhatsApp message. It could be even be a standard WhatsApp message that you're sending to all the persons. Look, we're setting up for a meeting for um, next week, Tuesday. 
options, 10 to 2, 2 to 4, which one would be more suitable for you? And you'll get a quicker response than probably waiting on an email to come. So you have to, you have to know what lead time you have. There will be urgent meetings that you don't have such a long lead time. And so that is when the, the quick calls, the quick WhatsApp comes into play. But you, if you have enough lead time, um, two days before the meeting, you should know who is coming to the meeting and who is not. Because not only that, you want to make sure that your critical persons are confirmed. So you can't turn up on the day and your critical persons are not there. So there may be 10 persons in the meeting, but you know that out of this 10, I need the six persons. Those are the six persons first who I'm interested in. The next four can come in my next phase. Okay. Um, and I, I actually, I like what you say about the quick call because nowadays in this fast paced WhatsApp world, sometimes <laughs> you don't know that. If you just pick up the phone and call the person, you <laughs> can get a response. So Alvaro, you are uh, the classic example of a virtual workspace. That <laughs> yes. you are, you exist, your office is in cyber world for a multinational organization. And mm -hmm. you know, no, you have tested <laughs> just about every type of face-to-face -face and, and the online environment and the teleconference environment. What is What are some of the differences that you're finding now in this online versus meeting physically in person world? So I must tell you that, um... When, you, when you're trying to when you're trying to um, describe them, so you have the face to face that we were all used to, as you say. You know, you get lunch, you get food, you get little um, planting tires, little fruits, and on a nice stick, right? So, so people would have missed um, the fellowship of uh -huh. the face to face meeting versus the convenience of the online, and mm -hmm. so it's, it's very it has become a little challenging to bridge that gap. You know, so you would have, you walked in, you walk into a face to face room and, you know, the energy sometimes, sometimes you have good energy and bad energy, you know, but when you have the good energy and it's a good vibe for the meeting and, mm -hmm. you know, the meeting start off right and it's just a nice fellowship and everybody does have the discussion. So, um, that's a key. That's a, that's a difference in terms of, um, what's happening in terms of face to face versus online. But then the convenience of the online makes it so easier for us to just move through and navigate and you know a lot of persons have said that they've become more productive even though it has led to more in it has led to more meetings just the availability of persons you know being online that has become a situation for most and and that's something we will have to just set back to manage so if you think about the fellowship versus the convenience that's one clear difference um you move you actually move through the agenda faster in the online, I find, um, yes. So, yes. Yeah. You, you move through the agenda a little faster. You have some more effective meetings online once it's just managed and run properly. Because mm -hmm. what you don't have, you don't have the usual chit chat type conversations yes. as you would have in the face to face. So it reduces that and increases the, the, the time and the focus level required for sure. the online meetings. As long as you turn up 100% present, 100% mm -hmm. available, all your faculties working on the online, you can have a productive meeting. Yes. And then um, in terms of the online, the flip side of that is you will have some persons who are pretty good with the technology and another set of people who are either having trouble with the particular technology or there are issues with the connectivity, which sometimes will throw right. off the flow of the meeting. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I see Justine Isaac saying, yes, face to face had that fellowship, that nice complimentary tea or coffee. <laughs> Yes, yes. And if you're stressed, <laughs> if you're stressed, you just get up and go just drink some coffee and you walk to the bathroom exactly. and you come back smiling or you go take a phone call. You know, it's it's, it's a little different and then you come back, you know, it, it, it's a difference. Yeah. Do you find though that um you have less engagement sometimes on a face-to-face, -face, especially if cameras aren't on? Do you think there's a risk? On a, on a online. Yeah. Sorry, online. On online. Yeah. Yes. 
Yes. And so um, that's why I mentioned earlier that you have to turn up with all your fo- your, 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 um, your faculty working because what happens is that, you know, the cameras are off mostly and people are very comfortable with the cameras being off. You know, sometimes they're having a bad hair day. You know, mm-hmm. you know if you were in the face to face meeting, yes, you probably would, you'd have to dress properly. But you may be having a bad hair day or you may be just having a bad day and you're very happy that the camera is off. But um, there's sometimes it's less, it's, it's less engaging. But as long as you turn up fully present, sometimes you don't even realize that you're online, but you're just having such a very good, um, effective and productive meeting that you know it becomes a less concern however there there's going to have to be a lot of strategies that the the chairperson employs in yeah. terms of you know engaging those persons um because sometimes you can complete a conversation and you're asking if everybody's okay you probably hear from one person yes you'd like to hear from more persons but throughout the meeting you'll probably have to check um with some persons to make sure they're okay because what is also missing mm-hmm. on the online that is available in the face-to-face is the whole body language right so when yeah. you're in a face-to-face you know if somebody said them agree or don't agree even if they agree sometimes if they their body language is showing something different you can check you can say you know what's there for you or is do you need any more clarification or you know whatever it is so that's the difference with the online the less engagement um you'll definitely definitely have to be checking in more often just to make uh, sure that all is so the role of the, the person yeah, the role of the chairperson. However, we were trained before we have to retrain our brains where the engagement is concerned. Because as you yeah. say, if we asked a question, when I'm online and my camera is off, I can fix up my voice before. After me, I said to myself, I agree with whatever I'm saying, oh, foolishness. And then I'm yeah. like, sure, no, not a problem. <laughs> yes, I'll get on that right away. <laughs> so I'm still, there are all of these multiple platforms and you know all of the platforms have an app on your phone and you have a different way sometimes of logging on on your computer and sometimes the experience is different you have you i think just about every platform can you touch on a little um description of the types of platforms and and some of your favorites what 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 would you highly recommend that people learn how to use well with the platforms Right. So you have various platforms. You have Microsoft Teams, you have um, Zoom, you have Starleaf, you have BlueJeans, you have um, Google Hangout, you name it. These platforms all exist. And so it becomes, um, we now have to get so tech savvy. We have to learn everything. We have to learn how to screen, we have to learn how to record, we have to learn how to do this, etc. And, you know, how you log on and everything. And so everybody's coming up the, the curve at different paces, but over time, we all would have been on some of these platforms. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's very easy to use Zoom. It's very easy to use Zoom. It's, 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 it's very user friendly. And um, so that is at one of the top on my list in terms of using Zoom and depending on how you're using it for meetings, for webinars, you know, the different features that are there, the breakout rooms, you know, whatever it is. So it it all depends, but Zoom is very user friendly. Um, Microsoft Teams, I find as well, is also Mm -hmm. a little, it's, it's, it's easy to use. And so those two would have been my two top platforms that I would go to um, for meetings. Zoom and, and, and Microsoft Teams. What mm-hmm. I have found too is that um, where, where when you're using a platform, you know, in the same way when you sometimes you'll check out a meeting room, you know, is the AC yeah. work, the lighting like, will the projector work? We have to switch our brains to that same kind of preparation to use the platform. How do you set up a breakout room? So <laughs> we, we, how, how do you... Um, organize yourself as you prepare for different types of persons, sharing screens, etc. What right. tips are for organizing yourself with using these tech technology platforms? 
right. So you have to treat it like you're going to a physical meeting. I tell, um, because I support a group of assistants as well. And even when I train assistants externally, I will say to them, look, you treat it like it is an, a physical meeting in the same way how you as the support person or the organizer of the meeting would have to reach at least 15 minutes before to mm -hmm. check if the room was okay. You're going to log in at least 15, 10 minutes before, before other persons start to come in so that you are there readily available in the same way, probably to open a door, you're letting them in. Okay. So you have to treat it the same way. You also have to, in the same way, how you would have made sure that um, the equipment would have been in a physical room that you have to set up the same mm -hmm. thing. Make sure that your share screen is on everybody to share. So, yeah are the persons who you know need to share so as long as you have to prepare in advance to make sure that you block that time to be on a little early to mm -hmm. make sure that all of those things are in working order sometimes and this has happened to me before where um i realized that i couldn't log on i created the meeting but i could not log on to the the platform for some reason and i immediately had to switch so it's like switching a meeting room. So because me as the facilitator, gone, it and I realized that it was more of a technical problem with the platform. I switched platforms to use something else. So mm -hmm. it is um it is important that as the facilitator, the organizers for the meetings or whoever is supporting, that you reach on a little early to test the things and to see if they're in good working order. And mm -hmm. what you could do is just have a standing checklist. Mm. have a standing checklist there are things that you'll be checking for these five things boom 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 paste it on your laptop paste it on your workspace and you know that when you're going on um you can check so that it becomes a little easier for you some people may be up the curve farther than some but some people may need a reminder and and that will help you so you know everybody's saying Altia, like find your checklist where you have find your checklist <laughs> No, so I started. I'm like, my checklist is simple, right? So I, I, I am making sure that, okay, remember to mute mics. I'm not kidding you because sometimes you can take anything for granted when I'm planning because you can be, um, you can be there and you get distracted with something. But I remember, I want to make sure that I mute you when you come on so that we don't disturb the meetings. Yeah. So you also want to, especially in this virtual platform, you also want to make sure that you rename the persons on the back end because some come on from iPhone 6, 7, 8 and mm -hmm. Galaxy 10 and whatever it is. So you have to be alert. You may not catch it in the beginning because sometimes you don't know until later in the meeting when you mm -hmm. either hear them speak or if you message them privately to see um, who is there? Some persons may wait, be, depending on the sensitivity of the meeting. If you're coming mm -hmm. on a Galaxy um, ABC, you're going to be in the waiting room until I message you and ask you who you are, right? Mm -hmm. So you have to be very conscious of these things when you're when you're planning inside um, a virtual meeting. So don't be on my checklist. Re rename, share screen, uh, mute mics, those things. You'll be checking for those things. So Althea, because you, you know, you are Althea Walters and you <laughs> make very complex things seem very simple. So and I know people are watching and them saying, but Althea is super bright, you know. Althea knows also good on Microsoft Teams and do all kinds <laughs> of things. But there was a time that you would not have known how to use Zoom Absolutely the way you do not. yourself up to the curve. Because you would have practiced, you would have read. What, what, what did you do? What was your process? What has your process been? Well, I never had a process. I was just flung into the deep end when COVID came. Yeah, so I just had to learn it, swim it, swim it out and figure it out, figure out the things along the way. There was no long process to learn anything. So even when persons started to tell me about blue jeans, I'm like, I was totally confused. Like, what is this? You know, but it was the meeting platform. So you have to, I, I literally learned along the way and, um, getting help like you know you need a it support okay tell me how this works 
you know, sort of tell me what happens, where do I go for this? And if you even if, if you had little sessions with probably two or three persons just to bounce it off, I remember doing that as well. Oh, so that is how you change the background. Oh, so that is how you do that. Oh, so that is how you go and retrieve the recording. Those things you learn along the way. We never get a script. You know, all of us just throw right into the deep end. I'm but um, and you have to learn, although some were, were more deliberate than some in making sure that they learned the platform. So it was yeah. important to how I function. It was important to how I support other persons. So it was also important that I learned what I, what I needed, the tools to support me. Yes, and Althea, I see Stacey Garden from I says so important for the host to be early. And I know that's something that you're very particular about. <laughs> and yes. Dan Patterson asked a very important question. Is it appropriate to send a virtual meeting etiquette etiquette email before a, a virtual meeting, or is that rude? No, it's not. <laughs> it's <laughs> It's not. The only problem with that is if they'll read it right before, right? So you may send, in a, send it and it lands nowhere. But if persons are, it's like a learning process, you know, it's behavior change. You know, some of us are, some of us are very open to, to what is happening. Meanwhile, some of us are really just gathering. I still get complaints. I hate this platform. I don't know why you do the meeting on that platform. You know, I still, you know, get those complaints. So it's a behavioral change. And even if I, yes, I do support in terms of a guideline that you send in terms of you know what is expected especially mute your mics all of those things that are required um however it's very important that the chair reinforces it at the beginning of the meeting uh, because they will miss the email it will be missed you know as you know when we get to talking i could sit down and listen <laughs> to you for days but i don't leave today without talking a bit on blazing beyond because you are right. You are a trainer, you are a motivator, and I think it's just important that our viewers know where to find you and to know about your other self as Blazing Beyond. Right. So Blazing Beyond is my training and coaching um, business. It's an umbrella group. So my gold tracker, which pe people are more familiar with, um, they're more familiar with my gold tracker, which is the planner, which is a tool. It's a productivity tool that I also use inside of um, Blazing Beyond trainings when I train on productivity. So I really focus on um, productivity training. I really I focus on administrative excellence because that's an area that we all need to strengthen. Um, also, leadership, leadership development and personal goal success, because it's important. That is how I came up with my goal tracker, because, you know, persons plan for their life properly, you know, and it's, it's left in the back end. And that results in, you know, I don't know if it's midlife crisis or <laughs> stressed or what, but we all stress out at some point in time when we realize that we're not going after our life goals. Yeah. So that is how that came about. And you can follow me at my goal tracker. That's my lead um, page at this point in time. But it all falls under the... The, the 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 umbrella blazing beyond which focuses on both corporate training for large companies small businesses and entrepreneurs and individuals yes yes and althea is and i can attest althea is the expert she is i mean par excellence when it comes to this entire area of productivity end to end and althea has effective running of meetings down to a science. She is Dr. Althea Walters, the PhD <laughs> of effective meetings. And <laughs> so Althea, thank you so much for joining us. And please follow Althea at My Goal Tracker and sign up for her training and courses because she does offer this kind of training and course and, and, and development. And some of the things that we do take for granted, even the, the, the art and skill of running effective meetings, and it is an right. art, is a particular skill set. So mm -hmm. thanks a lot, Althea. Thank you, thank you, Rochelle. <laughs> Great to have you. Wow.
Today is episode 34, and we just had Althea Walters, who is manager and group administ of group administration at JMMB Group Limited and founder and lead trainer at Blazing Beyond, and she can be followed at My Goal Tracker. Today, we're talking about how to run more effective meetings. So we've talked, we've laid a foundation who needs to come to the meeting? What are the platforms that need to be used? The person who is organizing the meeting, who is critical to ensuring that we have the right persons, the, the persons who will make those decisions, who also helps for that chairperson to be leading the meeting effectively. So now we're actually going to be joined by lead project architect of the PSOJ AFFP, Nevada Powell, and Lorian Ainsworth, who is CEO of the Branson Center. Now, you all know Nevada already, but Lorian, some of you may not have met on this show yet. And Lorian is, as I've said, she's CEO of the Branson Center for Entrepreneurship Caribbean, the region's leading accelerator for Caribbean entrepreneurs. She's a mother of two, an entrepreneur and wellness advocate. As a result of the current global pandemic, Lauren led her team through a major pivot by moving their programs to a 100% digital experience. The center currently offers training, mentorship, and coaching virtually to serve the immediate needs of the entrepreneurial ecosystem. She has 14 years of people leadership, marketing and project management experience across multiple industries and scale of businesses. Before assuming the role of CEO at Branson Center, she served as the center's director of development and communications. She has co-founded Support Me Virtual Business, a boutique business support consultancy providing marketing, project management, operations, and other management support services. We're just full of experts tonight, you know. She founded and hosted the Sales Funnel Summit in 2015 to help entrepreneurs create a profitable online business. Recently, she launched her own podcast, The Thriving CEO, a podcast for successful but overwhelmed entrepreneurs that helps them to feel less overwhelmed while still achieving through the three S's, system, support, and self-care. So today she's gonna to join us to talk about the system of running effective meetings. Lorianne, welcome. Oh, thank you. So happy to be here. <laughs> Nevada. Hey, happy, happy Thanksgiving, Rochelle and Lorianne. Yes, happy Thanksgiving. We have lots to be grateful for now. Absolutely. Yes, I, I, um, I have to be very grateful for my COVID cast husband, Nevada. <laughs> <laughs> Nevada, now, uh, let me just actually start with you. Nevada is a very interesting yes. meeting you need. Um, Nevada runs every meeting like a project. For those of us who have been in meetings with him, sometimes he can be a little abrasive. He certainly gets things done. So we're actually going to be talking to Lorian about different styles of leadership of meetings and what style is necessary at what point. Mm -hmm. So, Nevada. Yes. We, we usually have a little process before our meetings where mm -hmm. we do uh, a, a, a review of the persons who need to attend. We heard from Althea, who needs to be there? Where does the meeting, what do we need to achieve? And I just want you to start blanket. What are some of the key tips yes. for each stage of a meeting? Okay. Well, I think what, what would be helpful is probably I'll lay out the various stages of a meeting. Mm -hmm. And then what I think is that Lorian and I can then discuss each one in more detail what the personnel is, what we need, et cetera. So let me just sort of broadly um, give the idea. The first question you need to ask is, should you have a meeting at all? Mm -hmm. And this is shocking because the bias always is to have meetings. And one of the things that Althea spoke about, which is unfortunate, is that meetings have now become a political issue as opposed to a productive issue. Meaning people want to go to the meeting because of the senior people that are there versus trying to figure out who actually needs to be there. So the first thing is, should there be a meeting? That's the first question, which we should address. The second is, as you said, is, is who should agree on who should attend. And if somebody can be at a, if somebody can not be at a meeting and the meeting goes fine, they probably shouldn't be there. If somebody can be at a meeting and not say a word, possibly they shouldn't be there, right? So we should explore things about who needs to be at the meeting. 
there's also the issue of crafting the agenda. And what you find very often is agendas are not very clear and concise as they need to be, and therefore can't guide and direct the meeting as clearly as it as it should. Now, on the some, point of crafting the agenda, because yes. you know, sometimes we use a, a, a template that we just keep recreating from week to week for the yes. agenda. And yes. We actually don't talk about what we do need to discuss and you can't look at the agenda and not and understand even what the, the item is. Is, yes. is there a particular way that one should word even your agenda? Yes. Well, first of all, even with a standing meeting, because remember, you know, people also look for the signal of the seriousness of the meeting. I've seen situations where people just keep sending the same agenda. So your audience recognizes, oh, this, this host, this agenda designer, actually is not that interested in the meeting because they just lazily put in. Remember, you have to be proactive and look like you actually care about the meeting because if you leave the meeting, don't care about the meeting, then the people there certainly don't care about the meeting, right? So that sense of the clarity of the agenda is around the words and what exactly we're trying to get done. Are we trying yes. to make a decision? I'm trying. To, are we trying to update? Are we trying mm -hmm. to rally the troops? Are we trying to share? So depending on, for each item, it could be different. It needs to be clearly articulated. Also, assume that not everybody in the meeting knows the jargon. So it must be written in a way that anybody can understand it, right? Anybody in the, in the, company, or in the company or whatever. Then there's the issue of the pre-meeting discussions. And very often, if something's going to be conflicting or there's gonna be tension, rather than have it blow up in the meeting, talk to the people then before that you think it may be controversial. Give people an idea what they're expected to contribute to. Give, so some amount of pre-management is also, I think, help to, help to make a meeting more crucial. Then there's the issue of ensuring the meeting itself, what the flow should be, and how you bring people in, and how you mm -hmm. ask questions. And also allow people to think, right? You can have silence in a meeting and say, why don't we think about this for two minutes? No, 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 no we don't need to rush, rush, rush to give an answer as another um, possibility. Then the end of the meeting, which is another part of it, is also the wrap up. How do you say, this is what we've decided. This is what we're gonna do. This is how we're gonna go forward, right? Very clear again. And last is what I call the post-meeting momentum. If a meeting was a set of things that's supposed to have happened, the momentum for what's supposed to have happened is highest right after the meeting. So minutes that come two weeks later or not at all, or not clearly giving people responsibilities to do what, again, it mitigates the value of the meeting. So again, seven areas. Should we have a meeting? Who should attend and why? Agree on the agenda. What are we trying to get through in the time? Um, Pre-meeting discussions if necessary to make sure everybody's fully prepared. By the way, always assume that nobody's going to read, read the material. So you have to present it in the meeting because plenty of people don't, don't read. And I, I, you watch them trying to fake it or the, the meeting just should assume that nobody read the, read the material. Inside the meeting, to make sure that there's the appropriate flow and the appropriate positions and decisions and information are solicited. End of meeting wrap up, absolutely crucial. And therefore the meeting cannot end in a kind of rush way. You need the 15, 20 minutes to say, here's what we agreed, here's what we decided, here's what we think. And last of all, the post meeting momentum and directives, what's supposed to happen now, right after the meeting. So our viewers, you may be saying to yourself, you know, where do I find this information that Althea has started us on and Nevada has given us these tips? Please, if you have not yet subscribed to our weekly memo, please subscribe at SME, email us at SME at PSOJ.org, or you can visit us at Small Business Portal. We have a wealth of information this week. Now, Lorian A. CEO of the Branson Center for Entrepreneurship. Now, Lorian, as the CEO of a business, I know when you call a meeting, the CEO has called a meeting that it is highly likely that people will attend the meeting. And they're also anticipating that it shall be a CEO meeting. Now, what are some of your key tips? What are some of the skills and strategies that you utilize in running your meetings? Yes, thank you for that question. I think that's an awesome question because, yes, we're talking to, I'm sure we have many entrepreneurs on the call right now who have their own businesses and perhaps they have smaller teams, right? And so when the CEO of a 
big company like JMMB calls a meeting, it's with few, a select few people, but perhaps when an entrepreneur is calling a meeting, it's probably with their entire team, right? So that's probably a usual thing that's happening. And one of the things I, well, I totally agree with everything that Nevada said in terms of the structure of, you know, the pre-meeting, the, you know, the pre-conversations, et cetera. Um, but what I like to do is ensure that depending on the type of meeting, I'm looking at the time and people's schedules. Because if it is a decision-making meeting, people have a finite amount of willpower to make decisions, right? And if you're calling a meeting after lunch or after someone has had five meetings for the day, rest assured you're not having a productive meeting. And rest assured that that decision is probably not the best decision that's being made. For me, as a CEO, I have a lot of meetings and I've tried my best to reduce those. Why? Because I need to be able to make decisions that are going to move the business or do something that's critical. And I have those meetings as early as possible because I want to make sure that my meetings that require my brain power to make a specific decision are done early when I'm fresh, when I'm you know ready to go. Another thing is that people are coming from different spaces. You don't know where people are coming from grounding everyone into the meeting when they come to have this discussion. I think that's a very important first step, you know, not just getting into business as usual. Here's what we're going to achieve, but, you know, really readying everybody, allowing them to release all the baggage that they've had from the day or, you know, whatever is going on with them. I really growing everyone into the space. I know JMMB does that very well, um, but it's something that I think businesses ought to be looking at doing um, so those are two of the things that I really take into consideration when I am calling my meetings. Another thing I do is I too love project management, right? And I take a project management approach for everything. So, you know, since COVID hit and my entire team, we went online, you know, we moved to, to you know, all of our meetings are online, everything is online and it's hard. So what I do is I use a project management tool. I love Asana. That is a tool that I use. And... I ensure that everybody on the team is coming prepared to deliver their portion of the meeting so that everyone is engaged and utilizing that project management tool as a guide. So when we're coming to the meeting, we're not just looking at this agenda that is, as I think you had mentioned earlier, you know, this typical template. We're looking in this stock in this project tool with a specific, here's a progress. So everyone is coming to the meeting to deliver what they have been working on, what the progress is, where they're having any troubles. Those are in the update meetings. And so those are kind of some of my um, strategies right there. Okay, so we actually have two different types of personalities in yourself and um, Nevada. And both of you still use that kind of project management approach. Now, you know, in meetings, meetings are a, a, a meeting of people with their baggage, their different personalities, who are morning people, who are night people, who don't love talk, who will talk for the whole meeting. In terms of managing personalities in the meetings, are there any particular tips that you can give to bringing out the quiet people quieting down the chatty people what are some of your tips though? yeah i think that's a great question too and you know i also want to reiterate what i think it's the um second point that nevada made in terms of having those pre-meetings ah. i think that's important particularly when you know the people who are in the meeting right if you know the people who are like the naysayers or the person who's going to chat a lot and just say you know quell that before the meeting because you know people's personalities are their personalities but if you know that you know get into that space have that conversation see what's going on with them because it may not be that they just want to be naysayers maybe there's something else that's going on you know maybe they're not they don't feel like they're being seen or they're being heard and so they take the time to be in the spotlight at that point you know or maybe there's really something else going on so have that conversation with those people but if you're in a meeting you know you really need to call out people <laughs> if people are being quiet, you need to let everyone know that each person in this meeting was called to this meeting for a specific reason and they have value to add. So, you know, add, letting people know, hey, here's why I have you in this meeting here in Nevada. Here's your perspective, right? And here's why you're so important to this meeting. So if everyone understands that we're not just here to warm seats, but that you have a specific reason, then it allows people to feel a comfort that hey, I'm actually here to add value. I'm not just here to be a spectator, you know, mm -hmm. and of course, calling them out. 
Yeah. Nevada, on that point of calling out, you're running yeah. a meeting, decisions are to be made, there are particular deliverables of for persons. And I find a part of our Caribbean culture is sometimes we don't like to call people out and we don't like to put people on the spot. Mm -hmm. um, what are your feelings about that? And how do you hold people accountable? Because you know when people say their name come up on the action item, them start twitch. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> okay, so I will say that I am a work in progress <laughs> um, with respect to the calling people out. I think I'm on the side of more harsher calling people out, but I actually think there's a gentler way to do it than I do. But the issue, so the issue is, first, you need to be clear what it is that they're supposed to deliver. And very often, and again, it's the, meet, the, the meeting manager's fault for this, we were ambiguous in what the deliverable was. And we're ambiguous, I mean, yes, they're supposed to deliver a marketing plan, broadly, let's say, but what specifically were they supposed to deliver? They were supposed to deliver a marketing plan for the next six months, under this budget that targets this market. So we need to articulate or work with them exactly what it is that's supposed to be delivered. Now, when we get to the meeting and their section of the thing or what they're, they're, they're talking about, and we say, where are you with the marketing plan with respect to, and you can name it again, the bud, this budget, this, 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 and then have them answer. Because very often, in fact, what happens is when you're not clear, the mm -hmm. participants won't be clear and they'll try to fake you out. They'd be like, yeah, man, we're coming forward with marketing plan. There's going to be some big things going on in the company. Yeah, a seat, a seat. We're going to be selling who need more this year. Push back. How much more? To whom are we selling? How are we going to pay for the marketing to get there? What's your estimate of our acquisition cost for each of the things that we're selling? Right? Pull the meeting down to specificity. Because remember, you're also training yes. and organization to work together. For example, I have a bias very often of working with younger people because they have not yet learned many of the bad habits. So mm -hmm. I, working with people who are just graduated from college and that sort of thing, right? I am best in trying to, what I call guided direction and trying to say, this is what we're talking about now, where are we, etc. And that's kind of a, a critical thing around um, how you guide a meeting and assure accountability. But you must call it, yes. but you can call it nicely. I suspect Lorian is a nice caller. <laughs> and we're actually seeing some questions coming in. Tara, I see your question. We'll soon get to our viewer questions. Lorian, um, on the points that yes. Nevada is making, I want you to switch roles a bit. There are instances where you are chairing mm -hmm. the meeting and there are instances where you are the leader of the organization and you are an attendee at the meeting in that role how do you manage your role as ceo and attending the meeting with your own deliverables and also managing the meeting itself because you know some things need to yeah, yeah. I think it's, you know, I think it's also a coaching opportunity for your team members. And so I treat it that way. So I like to, I, I like to empower people. And I think that a lot of leaders can veer on a direction of, I know more than you do. So I'm going to call you out on that immediately. And I think that that's a little dangerous because it, people will go within and they will shut down. So it's an opportunity for you to steer the meeting. And sometimes I do that by simply, hey, what about so-and-so, you know, and kind of beg the question so that they can get that trigger that, okay, you should be asking this versus constantly butting in and saying, no, well, you know, and taking over. And I think that's even more important when you have other stakeholders in the meeting, particularly, you know, it's not an internal meeting, it's external. You want to empower your team because I don't want to have to be in that meeting all the time. I want my team members to be able to take those meetings on and come back and give me the update. So within that meeting, there is that kind of begging the question, staring that my deliverables, I treat it as though I am, when it is my deliverable, like I'm an employee, I'm going to give my update, here's what I'm doing, or my apology for whatever hasn't happened or occurred, never of the view, well, I'm the CEO, so I'm not responsible or accountable to what I needed to deliver, because you have to lead by example. And there's also an opportunity for you to have one-on-one -on -one meetings with your team member who are having those kind of meetings. So, you know, if you're in that meeting, you realize, you know, I needed to give her a little bit more, him a little bit more direction, 
after the meeting, have a little one-on-one -on -one and say, here, you know, you did this great. And I think you always lead with, here's what you did really great, but here's where you need some improvement on this, or here's how you could have handled this a little bit better. So I think it's always a coaching opportunity if you are the CEO in that um, kind of situation. Yes. And you, you know, I, I'm, I'm glad you talked about just recognizing where persons need to speak up because the next question I have is, you know, some of which shame tree, it's deeply rude. And we have <laughs> not because we're going to look fool, fool. Yeah. Um, and, and many times we are the ones required to answer the question or to ask the question. How do you manage that kind of, the, the person is integral to the meeting and will not speak. You constantly have to be pulling them out. Nevada, you're a work in progress. How do you do that? Yes. I think um, sometimes, especially the people who want to feel silly, I will sometimes ask the question myself the silly question to try and also get the room comfortable because I have, you have found to, you know, I work a lot with, a, um, I do consulting for even some large companies and I've been in situations where there are concepts that are widespread spoken about in the company and most of the people actually don't understand it, and so, but they've been using it for years. So I sometimes ask, what this mean? I hear it in a whole heap of meetings. I see it showing up in a whole heap of documents. What does this exactly mean? And then you hear the shuffle and the thing and the thing until finally somebody just says it. And then somebody realizes now, what wow. mean? Oh, a holy heap never know um, what this mean, right? But so I always say, when you're in the meeting, assume that not everybody is tracking and therefore speak in a way and ask questions in a way such that the one who may not be tracking starts to understand what's going on. And further, as Laurie, uh, Laurie said, you know, you can ask somebody what they thought, what they think about a particular thing. And again, be gentle because it doesn't have to be a exposure, but be gentle around, you know, that sounds like it could be more complicated than it needs to be. What do you think, Bob? You know, in a way that then gets him to, to talk. Okay. But I also say, watch the faces. Because while people may not say, if I'm having a look like this, what, what, what am I talking about, right? And then you say, Bob, you're, Bob, you're not following, you may not be following this or whatever, right? So be aware, or somebody you see somebody dying to take a thing, or somebody strongly disagrees, open up the space for disagreement. It may have to say that, you know, we have to, we'll have to allow disagreement in this meeting. And to be honest, I'm seeing Lorian not looking that comfortable. Mm -hmm. So Lorian, we want you to express what your concerns are with the marketing budget. What is your concern with the marketing plan? And in fact, very often, even if it's not an individual thing, suppose you come to the end of a meeting or the end of a module or an agenda, and everybody, so everybody agree? Um, yeah, 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 yeah. But the real reason that everybody's agreeing is that we all get out of the meeting, right? Which is as Delorean say, we can't afford that because we actually need, the, we need a real decision. Then switch it. Say, now I want to talk about the critique. I need to hear from everybody what's wrong with this. Everybody has agreed, I understand. But no, I want to hear what's wrong with this. Why well, not wrong with this? You know, no, there must be something wrong. So here's my criticism, this. And then you have a, you, you, can, you allow the meeting to change the dynamic because then no, it's not like everybody agreeing on the thing to try and get out of the meeting. We now have a robust discussion. Yes. So Lauren, on that point, your the Branson Center has gone one hundred percent digital. It yes. was a lot easier when we were face to face across the room from each other to see the twitching, to see the body language. What yeah. are some of the key tips? How how do we transition into this online environment when we're leading meetings to feel the energy of a room, a virtual room? Yeah, it's it's been very tough. And I will say that, you know, moving even our entrepreneurs, you know, when we just moved online, all of a sudden, these people who are just like so full of energy, and they were just chatting with each other, they're so in silence, and we're like, oh, what happened, right? And it's online experience, because people have this now, you know, this computer to hide behind, and they no longer need to ask the questions, they no longer need to engage. So what Nevada has said, I totally subscribe to. When people are being silent, you need to call them out. This has happened on many of our workshops with our entrepreneurs, but it's asking specific questions. Not what you think, but hey, do you think that that should be red instead of blue? You know, asking them very specific questions so that they can 
you really pull that out. How does it apply to you and your business? You know, and when we do that, you're pulling out that kind of conversation and it's allowing them and it's giving them the space to start speaking because people also believe that, you know, they're taking up airtime. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, you have to give people permission to do that as well. So moving online was very difficult, but learning those strategies throughout this whole year, I can't believe it's been a whole year now, um, has helped us. And you know what? We are getting amazing results and amazing um, feedback from this online experience because of pulling out people that way. But also from my team perspective, you know, having everyone in the same room as you know you and Althea were discussing before you know being able to have a tea and chat a little bit it's also so important to have that little icebreaker time you know that time where people can kind of chit chat and get you know have that informal discussion so that when you come into the meeting it's not um again all business you know again probably one of those grounding techniques just to get people you know into the space and so that has supported us in the online space and, you know, the truth is not everyone is comfortable with their video on, but sometimes it may be necessary for you to ask people to put videos on or let people know ahead of time. Guys, we really want to have a face-to-face -face conversation. So, you know, pretty up, do up here, get things done, yeah. but we're going to have it face-to-face -face so they can really see the interaction and get to see that body language that Althea was talking about. Yeah. So, Lorian, yeah. somebody asked earlier, earlier in the chat, and it's always the second time you've used the word grounding. Ah. <laughs> grounding. Right. Okay. So grounding meaning, you know, when you, your energy is all over the place, it means that that's very, um, I'm just using very specific terms. Like you're out there, your energy's out there, you're all over the place. Your mind is, you know, thinking about a million different things when you're grounding, we're just bringing you back into this space, into this moment, you're being present. And I remember, and Althea and Rochelle were speaking about that earlier, being your all, all of your mm -hmm. faculties, faculties being here mm -hmm. is a technique to, uh, grounding is a technique to do that. And grounding can be as simple as everyone taking a minute to breathe together, everyone just taking a minute to say, hey, you know, what am I grateful for today? You know, however you want to do it, whether it's maybe something fun, again, like I was talking about, you know, having that, you know, chit chat, informal chit chat so that people can remove what's, what else is happening in their world so that they can just refocus here. Yeah. You know, that so energy. Thing that Jeremy B does, which you know, right? Every yes. meeting starts with a prayer and every meeting starts with somebody reading the vision of love. And yeah. it's a signal that the meeting is about to begin. And it feels like that is, yeah. I don't even call it that a gemini, but that feels like a grounding moment. Yeah. I, yeah, I do. And, and I said it earlier, you know, um, I, I was at GMMB at one point in time and it is a grounding thing. You know, it works for some people, it doesn't work for everyone. So, you know, you have mm -hmm. to know who you're talking to, who's yeah. your audience, right? Mm -hmm. Because if you're having a meeting with persons, external persons, mm -hmm. that may not be the right thing. You know, it may just be, you know, guys, how was your day today? You know, like, you know, let's tell tell you a little funny story you know get people into the space into a different energy that's really what you're looking for you know get people into a different energy so yeah i think that's an important um yeah. aspect and, and dorian i'm glad you made the point too that there's some you you do have to know your audience for a meeting and some people do if they're not used to it and sometimes you have to just keep at it till they start grounding with you yes but um sometimes even just directing persons to the purpose of the meeting and having those initial introductions as the person leading the meeting so we have nevada here to discuss xyz lorian is going to go through this so everybody kind of gets a reset into their purpose into the meeting and this brings me to the point because uh, a lot of times as the leader of the meeting we forget so we have to be prepared so we send out the material and a lot of times people haven't read it you can't lead the meeting and you don't read the material yeah <laughs> Lorian. yeah when you are mm -hmm. leading, <laughs> what's the level of preparation that is necessary for running an effective meeting yes great question and i think that's like one of the most important things because again knowing your audience right 
you're having a board meeting, you have to send out your board papers. You <laughs> make sure that your board knows what you're what, what they're coming to discuss because these are very busy people, or your mentors or your coaches, you know, people who are giving their time that they could be using their time for something else. So you have to be mindful of your audience. But things like that. And I would say if you're doing something where you need a decision to be made with a dynamic group of people like that, make sure you let them know that you're asking for what's your ask before you come into the meeting, right? So here's what I want approval on, or here's what I want to talk what I wanted to also agree on and touching on something that was spoken about earlier those pre-meetings if you have a decision to be made in a meeting and you've done your job properly you know the answer before the meeting right and that's so critical because yes. yeah you know the answer so you've done all your pre-work so when you come to the meeting the meeting can be half an hour but you've probably spent an hour already with yes. everyone getting them to buy in because it's an opportunity for you to persuade you know, yeah. to get buy-in, you know, if you're not going to get a buy-in, it's an opportunity, as Nevada said earlier, for you to understand what the criti criticisms are, what, what you're, what you're going to be faced mm -hmm. with. But not just you, it's for the people, for your audience. Because if you come to a meeting and you throw something at people that they did not expect, That's your right. meeting mash up. That's <laughs> right. right. Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, the other thing, um, Rochelle as well, is with, with the prep stuff. And in the Amazon meeting, this is one thing that they do, which is quite clear they actually give people an opportunity at the beginning of the meeting to read the documents that they know nobody read. <laughs> so they don't even pretend that people would have been prepared because everybody's faking it. And they, so you, you first give the people the opportunity to read it. And then what you do is you have a discussion about what they understand. Mm -hmm. So it's a different kind of grounding. It's intellectual grounding, but it says, okay, take the 20 minutes to read the thing. All right, Rochelle, what are the key issues for you based on the document that you have read? All right, Lorian, what are the key issues for you that Rochelle didn't raise that you think is crucial? And therefore, everybody's read and everybody is engaged. Yeah. Uh -huh. Versus you get the people say, yeah, man, I read it. Yeah, man, good, do good document. That's a sure sign that they don't read it. Good yes. document. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Or yeah. Interesting points. There's some interesting points in there. Yeah. <laughs> so, Nevada, in terms of, of that direction though, um we have you have a meeting, you know that you have 48 minutes with the decision makers because there's another large meeting after, and you've been able to squeeze everybody in. How do you yeah. keep meetings on track without yeah. being downright rude? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, remember, as Lorian said, you know, you need to make sure that you are prepared. Now, this is not for you to dominate the meeting, but it's what I call aggressive guidance of the meeting. Mm -hmm. So you try to get a, a bunch of people to make a decision in 40 minutes, 45 minutes, as you said. The first thing is, what is the key, key cri what are the things that somebody has to know to be able to make a decision, yeah. right? What's the target market? What's the budget? What's the this? What's the that? Right? You notice how we started this thing when we said, right? I said there are seven things that we need to do. Yeah. So what I would start the meeting by saying, we have to make, we have to agree on what we're doing with the marketing budget and what, uh, what, what target market we're going after. Here are the key criteria for. Uh, here's what we need to know to be able to make a decision. So I write the list of six. Here are the six things that we need to know, and I ask the group: Is there anything else? we we knew all of this? Can we make a decision? Or are there other things that we need to know to make a decision? Now, remember, I've already prepared. So it's very likely that the six is the six. But say, fine, it's not six. Somebody else add two. So now we have the eight things. And then we talk about each of the eight things. This is the budget. This is the target market. This is what's going on with the competition. Blah, 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 blah. And we come to the end now and I said, okay, we have now discussed all the inputs required to make a decision. I want you guys to pause for two minutes, three minutes, five minutes. Tell me which, write down, because then you don't get the group think, write down the decision that you would make and why, right? And then you start to do the polling. Who thinks we should increase the marketing budget? Three people say, tell me why. Who thinks we should decrease, decrease the marketing budget? Tell me why. Who thinks we should trans change the marketing budget and go after a different targeted market? Tell me why. What you then have is what I call intellectual transparency. Mm -hmm. Everybody in the room now understands the process by which the decision gets made and the way we came to agreement. Because another thing that's very common is that sometimes a decision gets made in a meeting and then you hear six months, seven months later, I agree with that. 
Come on. Me never agree. You were in the meeting. You yeah, everybody, them know whatever do. But <laughs> why were you there? Right? That's so that whole thing is about. So what you do is you make sure whatever the decision is. Now people can object, right? You say, all right, I seven of you agree, I don't agree. I here's my conscientious objection, and here's what I object to. And you record all of that. So whenever they come later, I said, I don't agree with that decision. Mm -hmm. No, actually, you were there and you're one of the people who said yes. Yeah. So Lorian, even on, on that point with you were one of the people who said yes, or you were one of the people that were supposed to be a part of this committee that should have met before we meet again. And, you know, at the end of a meeting, sometimes the meeting just have an energy and it just have a buzz and everybody's alive and then nothing happens. What are the key deliverables post meeting to keep that momentum going? Yeah, absolutely. Another critical step in the meeting, right? So, yeah, everybody forgets about everything once you left the meeting. Again, if, you know, multiple meetings people are going to. Critical that when you are wrapping up the meeting, first of all, that you have enough time to wrap up the meeting wow. properly. And that means if there are action items for persons that that is being said and reiterated at the end of the meeting. Nevada, you say you're going to do this. Rochelle, you said you're going to do this, you're going to do this by this time, right? And get the agreement, get people to actually say yes and confirm that they're doing what they're doing by when. It's also really great if you have visuals up there, if you're taking the notes and you can have it bullet point there that you can send out in an email immediately after. Minutes yes. should go out, you know, within 24 hours ideally, but even if, you know, let's not call it minutes, let's call it the, the action mm -hmm. items even, you know, something quick that you can get out, send it via email so that you have that follow up. You know, if you have a large team, you have project mm -hmm. team, you can have project support, people who can follow up with those persons, that's fantastic. But if you're a small business and you don't have that, you know, put some dates in people's calendars immediately. Nevada, yeah. you say you're gonna do this by this date, I'm sending a calendar invite and it's gonna say reminder, right? So you yeah. know what's happening Absolutely. when. And I think yeah. that that's so important when you're wrapping up a meeting and also next steps. The um, one thing I wanted to talk about what Laurie said, and this is what is what I call the trade off. So what tends to happen? So, so we had five topics that we wanted to cover. Mm -hmm. And then at the end of it, we're going to try and do a wrap up. What we need to do is to lock the end of the meeting, irrespective. So we're going to say the last 20 minutes is going to do this thing about the action items. So what happens is when we get through three, the tendency is to try and rush through the other two and then not have the, the wrap up at the end is actually the most important thing for the meeting to be attracted. So we've said we are now at the 20 minute point from the end of the meeting. We've only gotten through three of the issues, but we're going to pause there because far more important is for us to close and summarize what we have agreed in the three issues than trying to rush through for the other two. And then we can schedule another meeting focus on the other two. But do not try to rush through everything and then short change mm -hmm. the wrap up at the end. The wrap up is crucial because the yes. wrap up then drives the actions within the company and drives the accountability and responsibility. I just want to add to that, Nevada, something as well, because there's also a tendency to say, guys, can you give us another 10 minutes or another 15 minutes so we can finish this? What that does is it sets a precedent that your meetings are never on time. And if you do this consistently, less and less people are going to show up to your meetings. Less people are going to trust that you can run meetings efficiently and effectively. So I totally agree with what Nevada said. Let's pause here. Let's schedule another meeting, but respect people's time. And don't yes, be one of those yes. people. Can we just have another 20 minutes? Can we have another yes. 10 minutes? Yes. You're, when you start to lose the other yeah. thing is what I always say to people, the most important thing is to end on time. Mm -hmm. The second most important thing is to start on time. Right. But even, the point is, even if you didn't start on time, you have yes. to end on time. So if you're starting the meeting 20 minutes late, you then say we were planning to do five things. Realistically, now we're only going to be able to get through these three. Ah. Because that, as Lori said, it shows the respect for the time. And then people are people can then plan appropriately with your meeting. Can I schedule? Because there are some people's meeting who they're you're forced to take one hour afterwards because you don't know them going to be late, they're gonna start late, they're gonna put you late, etc. But if I know that when you set three o'clock, we're done at three, you have massively minimized the headaches in my own life, right? So very, very crucial. The most important thing is to end on time. Yeah. 
That, that's actually very interesting because I think we focus so much on that start on time and then we run the meetings for as long as we want. But if we are also focused, if we start with we're going to end on time and we're going to have these decisions made, um, as leaders of businesses, one, how do you manage yourself to ensure that you are on time in between meetings, one, and two, at what stage do you decide that a meeting, it doesn't make sense for us to go on because we probably don't have these two particular persons in there? At what stage do we decide we're, we're moving ahead or we, we need to set a new date? How do you do that? Yeah. Um, I think there are different situations and it depends, right? So if you're talking about us moving ahead, there's a project, there's something critical, a decision needs to be made because it's time sensitive, especially if you're the CEO or if you're the leader of that meeting, then you have to make a decision to make the decision and give the rationale for it afterwards, right? Yeah. So that's, that's important, one. And two, how do you manage your time being the leader with so many meetings? I personally have reduced meetings out of my life. I've reduced a lot of them because I actually have work to do too. And so what you find is that, you know, when you become the leader of your organization or your entrepreneur, or whoever, you actually have work to do and you don't bake in enough time to actually get your focus work done. So I schedule focus work in my calendar. I schedule my calendar with my time. I have my sacred time. That is stuff that I have to do. I have kids. I have things to do that is sacred. I make in that time. I have focus time where work has to be done. And then I have leave time open on my calendar for meetings. And my team will look at my calendar and know, okay, I can schedule a meeting with Laurie here, here, and here. But I also have standard meeting times with my team where I have that one-on-one -on -one ability to do coaching. So there are times where I know I will have meetings or there's there's a probability that I can have meetings, but it's a finite amount of time. Of course, you're gonna yeah. have those that pop up, you mm -hmm. know, but you know, you try to reduce that as much as possible. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, you know, Laura raised a couple of things that I wanted to address to the whole issue. She mentioned the whole issue of the standing meeting. There is no need for a standing meeting if there isn't necessarily progress to be made and updated. And what I'm finding now, everybody's setting up standing meeting and then actually they're just trying to kill time because there was actually no reason for a standing meeting on this because it actually takes three weeks to make progress from the last meeting. Mm -hmm. No, we can have a standing meeting, what I call an operational meeting, a Monday morning meeting that sets the, the company agenda for the week. What is it that we're trying to get done this week? And again, but that's a 15 minute meeting, 20 minute meeting, right? So for example, in the brand, you know, company maybe does branch meetings in the morning, right? And it's quick and it says, this is, this is, this is, this is what's supposed to happen. It's very structured about what's supposed to happen and so on. The other thing is um, dealing with the challenge of somebody who raised an issue and it's starting to take the meeting off track. And I always say, out of politeness, give it two or three minutes and then say, Rochelle, I understand what your issue is. You must name what Rochelle's frustration is. And then say, but Rochelle, and you even put it on the board so she feel good that she has been heard. But say, we're not going to deal with that or we cannot deal with that in this meeting because it's tangential to this decision. What I'd like you to do is to set up a meeting with Lori and bring a proposal to me on that topic. So you shift where it's going, you yeah. acknowledge, you shift, and you bring the meeting back to where it is. Because what I've found also is that in situations where people do not get a chance to see the CEO, for example, and they're in a meeting with the CEO about marketing, but the IT guy has been dying to see the CEO for weeks and not again time. The IT guy then tends to take the opportunity that he's sitting in the room to raise the IT issues. So it has to be that you need to be clear at the beginning and as you go through the meeting and at the end what this per the purpose of the meeting the, me the meeting is as dr smith says refocus um and we actually had some polls running um one of the questions that was asked do you prefer virtual or in-person meetings 53 percent said virtual and 47 percent said in person what virtual meeting platform does your company use the most? Which one we think came in number one? Zoom, I would say. Zoom, Zoom. Yes, so Zoom, 44%. <laughs> Microsoft Teams, 33%. Um, Cisco WebEx, 12%. And other, 11%. And 
Have you ever felt out of place? 67% of our respondents answered yes. And 33% answered no. So actually, I want us to, there are two, top, two areas I want us to cover. This whole matter of feeling out of place and I don't want you to address it from the perspective of the leader of the business but your own experience where you have felt out of place at a meeting and then we're going to get back we're going to we're going to end where we started do we actually need to have the meeting in the first place so Lorian, you both of you have worked all over the world and in in different um in different roles and have you've attended countless meetings. Lorian, when have you ever felt out of place and what made you feel out of place? Mm, okay. So I think, you know, going back to probably the first question, which was, you know, are in-person or virtual better? And I think it depends on the situation. And I think that situation has put me in a place of feeling a little uncomfortable when you're meeting with people who you have not met before and you're discussing issues and you can't see the person's face. It feels a little uncomfortable. I feel like I don't I haven't been able to get to know you, particularly in partnership discussions. You know, I felt very uncomfortable in those kind of meetings because I feel like when you're going to be making a big commitment like a joint venture or you know some partnership that's crucial to your business that to me is a face-to-face -face meeting so i have felt uncomfortable with those um virtual meetings in that way nevada you ever feel out of place yet yes yes you can and certainly when i was younger um i would say first of all when i took a chance i didn't actually prepare and i go go into the with topic ignorance and that feeling that is pretty daunting enough that I tend to over prepare. I tend to read things. The other thing is that because I lived in the United States for so long, there were many, many situations and I was doing consulting in the South and so on. There were many, many situations where, you know, you're the only black person in the room and maybe it's in my head, maybe it's true, doesn't matter, but I would have been hyper aware that the presumption would be that I wasn't capable, I wasn't thing, et cetera, et cetera. So what happened in that situation, and I always advise um, women who work for me as well, who sometimes feel uncomfortable in a room with men, D write your killer shot, your one and two killer shot. It's what I, I call your declarative statement about the business, about the direction, about something. What is the thing that you can say that pauses the room? And you say it at the right time that you're starting to feel uncomfortable because that is the thing that then the room says, wait, he's listening. Mm -hmm. He's listening. He's raising something that I had not yet thought of. Sometimes we have to find the comfort in the, um, in the execution and in the demonstration of our skills. And even if you're, you, you realize that a meeting isn't necessarily going well and you, 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 you're, you're starting to feel small, again, pause and think about the thing that you can say to bring you back, but don't let it corrode you. Because the more time you sit in the meeting and let it corrode you, then it becomes hard. Because then you become a person who, boy, I don't really set things in meetings, you know, or I really don't, we don't know, et cetera. And make sure you yeah. are prepared. Make sure you are prepared so and therefore can, can articulate some position that is clever. Yeah, <laughs> that's a good point, Nevada. So I just wanted to say, <laughs> you know, as, in, as an introvert, I'm a little bit, I have a tendency towards introversion. And mm -hmm. I, being in meetings, you know, there are persons, not because they're introverts, that they don't speak up because you have others who are in a meeting who just like to hear their voice and they're just constantly talking. I always want to say something, mm -hmm. right? But then you have those people who are introverts, but, you know, you have something to say. And I like the point that you make, Nevada, you know, have that power statement or whatever. But when you're listening, you know, make sure that you say something. I always try to make sure you say something, even if, you know, it's an, I agree with that or, and be seen and be heard in the meeting. But yes, I totally agree. And it can be uncomfortable, I think, for introverts. And it's a different experience for extroverts when you're in meetings. Yeah. And, mm -hmm. but also don't feel like, you know, you have to keep talking. Mm -hmm. if, if you are, if you do not have much to say, don't, don't feel like yeah. you have to keep yeah. doing it, you know, yeah. say that one yeah. thing and step back. There's a lot more power in mm -hmm. saying one or two things that are powerful than being that empty barrel, if it, if it is that, you know, what you're saying yeah. is just not adding value. 
Yeah. Correct. The yeah. other thing is um, in a situation where you, again, if you are managing the meeting and one or two people are tending to dominate, call it. Mm -hmm. Right, John, I think you've made some amazing points throughout this meeting. But what I want to do now is to make sure that Nadia gets in some things because Nadia really understands the marketing. Nadia really understands the technology. Big up the quiet person, right? Because you have to big up John. As Lorian said, John ready for talk. Every minute John talk, John talk. John, hold on. Hold on. Nadia know about technology. Let's hear from her on what's her perspective on technology. Yes. Wow. Very sage advice. And I'm glad that we are wrapping up to on that note, because it is very critical to that we understand our own participation in meetings. And many instances, we sit in meetings wondering, why am I even here? How am I with this group of people? Am I worthy? And guess what? If you don't feel worthy, it usually comes out. Prepare yourself. Ensure that going to the meeting, you are invited. So go on, go on through like you're invited. Yes. And even if you are the secondary invite, because the main invite couldn't come, go along the same way. <laughs> so, Lorianne, um, as we wrap up, I I want to go back to our starting point. We're talking today about how to run more effective meetings. You talked about how you schedule your calendar. What advice do you give us on determining do we even need a meeting at all? Yeah, I think that, you know, I think it was said earlier too, if it's something that can be said in an email or can be a round robin and it's a decision that has probably already been discussed, uh -huh. then you don't need to have a meeting. Send a document, round robin it to whomever it needs to be. If there are a few people who need to be who need to input into it. Maybe it's a phone call, maybe it's, you know, maybe it's a, a quick WhatsApp. So I think looking at your objective, looking and seeing how much time do we really need to solve this thing? If it's something to be solved, do we need to brainstorm? You know, those really look at what am I trying to achieve here? And can that, what's the shortest amount of time that it can be achieved? And if you really have decided that, look, I need this person's input and it needs to be in a, a discussion, have your meeting. If it can yeah. be a quick phone call, if it can be a round robin, you know, try to make better use of your time. You're, it's not, you're not an important person because you're going to meetings. <laughs> Believe me. <laughs> <laughs> so Lorian says you're not an important, you're not going to meetings is not what you should weigh not your importance on. That is yeah. not it, truly. Getting <laughs> stuff done. <laughs> That's when you're important. Getting stuff done. So Nevada, in yes. some we, we've talked about the foundation of setting up your meetings, your confirmations, your platforms. Yes. We've talked about actually running the meeting as participant, with running the meeting as chair, yes. running the meeting as the lead facilitator and participating in the meetings. Yes. Um, you always give us a good summary. How would you summarize some of the key things, key learnings from today? From, from today, yeah. So, you know, some of the things that um, Althea talked about, right, this idea that meetings are resource intensive. So only have them if they're necessary. Because uh -huh. the, the more people at that meeting, the less your company is being productive. Meetings are not, or very rarely, I shouldn't say not, but only the very exquisite facilitator can make a meeting work. work. So meetings is a time when your organization is not working and mm -hmm. therefore you're impacting the productivity, right? You have to be careful. And some of this thing that the meetings doesn't become about politics. And what typically is best with that, as we talked about this, right, is you invite the people whose expertise or whose opinion is most relevant. Sometimes it's not the senior person. Maybe mm -hmm. it's, not the, it's not the IT guy, who runs your IT is the little is the, is the little the one IT guy, real IT guy, not the IT architect, right? <laughs> so who is it that's critical to being in the meeting? And yes, you can explain to the bigger guy that you know we really need John's expert, uh, John's um expert expertise for this. The host, as they told us, the host needs to be early <laughs> because again, most annoying. When you're waiting for a meeting, I just say, host, who let you know? I've been waiting like 20, 20 minutes. I'm waiting. And that's why they're gone. I'm because gone. that's just, yeah. that was the disrespect. You just can't. Yeah, what foolishness is that, right? So the host needs to be needs to be early. 
And of course, as the host, you have to make sure mics mics are muted and um, uh, that sort of thing. Somebody brought up the idea of virtual etiquette email, which you can send, but Althea raised the issue that perhaps people won't necessarily um, mm -hmm. won't we'll necessarily read them. So you have to trigger uh, something by saying, please confirm that you've read it. Um, remember before that you come to the meeting, make sure this has happened and so on, right? Uh, we heard, talked about the some tools that people use. Um, Lori, uh, Lori, and uh, I think it was Chris, Chris Record on um, online talked about Asana mm -hmm. as a project management tool. That after meeting, who's supposed to do what? There's this notion of what they call RACI, R A C I, responsible, meaning that is the person who's actually going to do the work. Accountable. That is the person who makes sure that the work is going to be done and they're standing for it. C is consulted. So who, need, who we need to consult to find out what's the direction we could take. And I is informed. Who needs to be informed about the decision, right? Accountable for sure needs to be at the meeting. Consulted needs to be talked to before the meeting, but you may not need them at the meeting and certainly responsible needs to be at the meeting because they're the one that's going to be driving the effort. And again, remember to think about all meetings in terms of the seven areas. Raheem, just give me the slides, the two slides for a second. Okay, do you need a meeting? Who needs to be invited? The decision makers, provide those who can provide or receive critical input who are active contributors. Setting the agenda is critical clear objectives. Why are we having this meeting? Why is this person there? What are the decisions to be made? What's needed to make those decisions, right? Pre-meeting discussions, input on the agenda, input on the at attendees, explain why they're being invited, agree on whatever information or analysis is needed to ensure that it's that you go forward. Guiding a successful meeting, so that's in meeting, right? Meeting protocols, even if you don't start on time, you must end on time. Cut the number of topics that you have in order to respect people's time. Guided participation. Have them follow the agenda. Pull out the people who not necessarily talking, but you want to make sure that they are um, active. And after each section, summarize what was said or what was agreed. The closing out of the meeting, the ending of the meeting is critical. 15, 20 minutes. This part of the meeting is locked. No matter what you've gotten through the last 15 minutes, 20 minutes must be, this is what we've agreed and this is what's supposed to happen next. Summarize the decisions taken and why, outline what happens next, accountability, lay out who's doing what and when. And then of course the post meeting momentum. Whether it's meeting minutes, but Laurie, I'm right. It doesn't have to be no minutes, minutes. It bullet, really just bullet points are, are, are good about what uh, who's doing what, the decisions taken and why, and what timing, things will be done mm -hmm. and what are the open issues and how those open issues will be addressed. Thanks for that, Nevada. And for those of you who are wondering where do you get this information, because we really have provided quite a bit of information. We have a weekly memo and this week's memo, if you have not yet received it, email us at sme at psoj.org. Lorianne Ainsworth, always a pleasure. Thank you very much for joining us for Thank today's you. episode Thank of COVIDcast JA. Again, happy Thanksgiving. We give thanks for and to you. Thank you very much. So all of you, you wondering, you know, this is episode 34. That means that there have been 33 other episodes. And if this is your first time joining us, we are here every Thursday at 7.30 p.m. You can also find us on YouTube. And please visit us at smallbusinessportal.com. Today, we talked about how to run effective meetings. Do I need a meeting? Who needs to be in attendance at the meeting? What platform will I use? Is it a face-to-face -face meeting? Is it going to be a virtual meeting? It's COVID time. Many of our meetings are virtual. Ensure that you're on time if you're the host. Prepare, prepare, prepare. 
Preparation means those pre-meetings that we have where decisions are to be made. What are the decisions to be made? How clear is my agenda? Is it very, do my meeting attendees even understand what this meeting is about and why they are to be in attendance? Laurie and Ainsworth talked to us about grounding the meeting, bringing everybody into a level for the meeting. Um, Althea Walters, Althea talked to us that about 100% of our faculties need to be present at the meeting. So thank you very much, all of you, for being 100% present at episode 34 of COVID Cast JA, where we talked about running more effective meetings. We also talked about the post meeting momentum. And for this here meeting of COVID Cast JA, as part of your post meeting momentum, we encourage you to visit smallbusinessportal.com, where we provide you with information from pretty much A to Z on running your business. It is a resource full website, web page, and you will find information on financing. You will find this very episode, all of our episodes of COVID Cast JA. So we encourage you log on now, but don't really keep this information to yourself. Share, comment, and like. And please subscribe to us, subscribe to our YouTube page, and we look forward to having you for another episode of COVID Cast JA. Happy Thanksgiving. We are thankful for each of you, and we look forward to coming out successful on the other side of COVID. Please stay safe, wear your mask, keep sanitized. We'll see you again next week. So you have a great idea to start a business, but you don't know where to start. We completely understand. You have a lot of questions and almost no answers. Smallbusinessportal.com is here to help. At smallbusinessportal.com, you gain access to information on loans, grants, and investment opportunities from verified financial institutions. Guess what you also get? Useful business tips, access to training, all these services combine to make your business idea into a reality. Start your journey today at smallbusinessportal.com.